Kaur, uh, who is a professor in NLU Delhi and also Professor Chao, uh, Chao Zhi. Uh, I think I need to check with him how to uh, pronounce it in a correct manner. Otherwise, uh, it will be wrong to pronounce in wrong way. Uh, if I take this opportunity uh, uh, to introduce the speakers for today's topic, that is evaluation of performance of boards and management, I would like to uh, introduce Professor Harpreet Kaur first. Uh, Madam is a professor of law at National University Delhi, and she is involved in teaching corporate laws, securities, and regulations, and also the competition and entry trust issues. Uh, she is a Fulbright scholar in residence and served as chair professor of Indian studies on rotating chairs established by Indian Institute of Cultural Affairs at Faculty of Law. Lebanese University, Hanover, Germany from October 15 to April 16. She is also a fellow of International Visitors Leadership Program 2015 for antitrust laws. She is the director for the Center of Corporate Law and Corporate Governance at NLU Delhi, uh, an author of uh, a number of textbooks on business and corporate laws, and has also co-authored a textbook on competition law jurisprudence interpretation of statutes, law of torts and labor and industrial laws. Uh, she is also uh, serving as a visiting faculty to the Faculty of Law, uh, University of Bergen, Norway. Uh, if I take this opportunity to introduce Professor Shao, uh, has he joined Harpreet? Not yet, but you can. Uh... Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, for uh, the understanding of uh, uh, the participants, uh, I introduce Professor Xiao Zi. Uh, he is a professor and outstanding fellow of the Faculty of Law, the Chinese uh, University of Hong Kong. He is uh, concurrently associate dean research and head of the graduate division of law in the Faculty of Law. He has uh, specializations in comparating comparative studies on corporate laws and governance, including the securities regulation, financial regulations uh, across various jurisdictions as a matter of the comparative research. He has published extensively in leading peer-reviewed international journals, and his research has received significant funding support from Hong Kong SAR Government Research Grant Council, uh, PRC uh, Ministry of Education, as well as the Government of India. Uh, the Sumitomo Foundation uh, also has supported his research. Uh, Professor Shao is uh, a recipient of the prestigious CUHK Research Excellence Award in 2019, as well as CUHK Young Researcher Award in 2011. He is a dedicated teacher, which you can understand from uh, his uh, profile and contribution, and also a recipient of CUHK Vice Chancellor's Exemplary Teaching Award twice uh, in year 2010 and 2017. So I, I would take the opportunity once the Shao joins and uh, would like to uh, begin with the initial thoughts. See, boards uh, have, uh, have always uh, been at a challenge of addressing to uh, the role of, uh, of corporate governance, uh, which they are primarily entrusted with while uh, looking within the organization in terms of its, its strengths and uh, opportunities, uh, the areas which can further be developed so that it is uh, not only an organization which satisfies to the shareholders and stakeholders by meeting up their expectations, but also to emerge as a great place to work. Human resource is a, a key to the success of any organization. And if we excel in our work, we have the best possible corporate governance and excellent management supporting us, supporting the entire board. It takes the organization forward and uh, makes it as a, uh, as a, uh, you know, as part of the wish list of the best of the best talents. As part of the challenging role which the board has, uh, what is more important is to have uh, better clarity and better discharge. While having clarity of the role and discharging the role in an effective manner, what comes on way to my thought is the performance which needs to be evaluated by them themselves. In 
various literatures, including the mythological uh, literature, as well as uh, part of researches globally, uh, evaluating self, assessing one's own aspirations, one's own commitments towards us, and then reviewing to what extent we have contributed and what are the areas which can be considered as an opportunity to stretch further as far as the contribution is concerned is important. Taking this point as a lead, uh, regulatory frameworks in India, uh, along with uh, other jurisdictions as a matter of best practice, has involved board performance and the performance evaluation as a key aspect. Section 134, uh, specifically of uh, the Companies Act 2013, and also the mentions in the Schedule 4, uh, which dedicates to the Code of Conduct, there is a significant mention in guidelines as to what needs to be evaluated, who needs to evaluate it, what should be the frequency of evaluation, and how evaluations uh, needs to be disclosed and reported back. It also gives an indication towards how evaluations can be used as an exercise for providing the board and also the chairman to learn from, uh, from the evaluation-based feedback to lay, uh, lay down an action plan, which definitely could be a good strategy for improvising further. The same goes with the uh, SEBI listing obligations and disclosure requirements, uh, where it speaks of... Uh, uh, the importance of evaluation and the methodologies which uh, the companies could select. Today, we are here to uh, learn from the experts and discuss around key issues and also to understand what our participants who are the independent directors have in mind in terms of their quest for knowledge, which they can place in terms of questions once the initial round of uh, discussion across key areas complete so that we can have better interaction and good takeaways uh, from this one and a half hour session. I could see Professor Shaozi is uh, is online and I place my heartiest welcome to him. Uh, I'm sure out of his busy schedule, he has a spare time and I I'm sure uh, we would have a great learning. Before I move forward, I would like to learn from him how to pronounce the name or uh, correctly at my end because I don't want to uh, be repetitively wrong in this. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chair. I, I first of all would like to send my uh, sincere apologies uh, for being late. Uh, there was another commitment uh, which uh, I think overran a bit, uh, so that I, I, I sincerest uh, apologies. Uh, please do just uh, call me uh, either my first name, Chow, uh, or if you like, just call me Dr. Xi, or that, that either will be okay. Just call me Chow. I, I think this is a, a rather informal setting. I just uh, would love to share. Uh, what I uh, what I I, I have uh, with, uh, with such a discussion. That's, that's really uh, that's really great. Rather, I would take the liberty with your permission not to use professor as well. Uh, just uh, ciao. Okay, uh, you can call me Neeraj. Uh, so uh, going further, and I would like to begin uh, with, begin with uh, Harpreet first to understand what as a researcher. Uh, dedicated for decades uh, reading and uh, researching on this aspect understands uh, could be the challenge of the board in present time, especially when we have seen this pandemic, uh, uh, which impacts the go corporate governance and some of the areas, uh, as per your views, which needs to be focused more. Harpreet. Yes. Uh Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon to all the participants here and uh, my co-chair. Uh, I can I saw that there are so many senior people who are working as independent directors. They have joined here. And uh, so I would like to begin with this disclaimer that the knowledge which I'm sharing here is what I have understood after reading the company's law, company law and also teaching for so many years, because as I told you in the beginning that I have not yet served as the director on any of the board. So, but I have been in discussion with a lot of, uh, you know, many directors and have shared, uh, have seen their, uh, you know, uh, their uh, uh, problems which they face and what are the kinds of expectations and, you know, what are the uh, corporate governance developments and how the board is becoming more and more uh, a central team uh, for the corporate governance. Uh, 
Uh, so if I uh, take your question, um, Dr. Neeraj, uh, all of us have seen that, you know, how the COVID has uh, affected and there has been so much of business uncertainty. So definitely um, uh, the risk management has been one of the core areas for the board to, you know, uh, be prepared with. Uh, but risk management, uh, we could have been prepared only for you know, the, the risk that we can anticipate, but when we have a pandemic, uh, we do not, we, we don't expect this kind of, and we do not anticipate the kind of preparation that should, should have been there as a risk management. And risk management here covers not only the company and its financial position, but also uh, the stakeholders who are associated with the company, right? And also the shareholders, because at the end of the day, we, we talk about uh, shareholder value creation, which is one of the objectives which has been given to the board over a period of time. And if I if I take it from, from like corporate governance point of view, we have seen that how we have you know, reworked over a period of time on the definition of corporate governance and how the role of the board has been, you know, shifting. And especially uh, when we talk about independent directors, we say that they should have like a monitoring and an oversight, right? And independence uh, of the directors has been, and the board has been very important for us. But keeping this in the, in the pandemic, uh, that what, uh, how to protect our, um, you know, how to protect the the fundamental, you know, financials of the company in this kind of a situation that where production has stopped, right? And how we have to pay salaries to our employees. So whatever are the costs, the fixed costs and the variable costs that the company has to, uh, you know, get from the uh, from uh, from their earnings, and also, you know, when when it comes back. The question is that should we, when there is a pandemic, should we stop everything or whatever could progress, we continue with that, right? So here we have seen that the role of Ministry of Corporate Affairs has been very critical because this is with so many uh, notifications trying to give benefits to uh, to the companies, uh, whether it is related to the insolvency or it is related to holding of uh, you know, she, uh, annual general meetings uh, through the other audiovisual means. So, uh, when the system, when the regulatory system, which has been very strict with you, but it is trying to give you benefit during this time, I think companies were, um, in most of the most of the companies, they were able to, you know, uh, to to sail through this pandemic and are able to get back to their performances and. Also, uh, we have also noticed that there has been uh, a lot of diversification in the in the business, you know, uh, products also. That has also have been observed, especially for you know small companies. Um, so I think uh, when we we do have you know a regulatory um, a support, then uh, it is uh, we could have you know we could you know sustain ourselves because I know comparatively. Uh, I was, uh, you know, discussing with one of the professors of corporate law in South Africa, and I was discussing that how much, you know, benefit uh, we are providing, and he said that we we don't have such kind of regulatory intervention to to come in support of the companies to survive in this pandemic. So I think that's what I would like to uh, in brief uh, uh, say here. Um, Dr. Neeraj? Sir, you are not audible. Uh, please switch on your uh, Great. So, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Now, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, it's great. And if I underline what you have just deliberated, value creation uh, is the main spotlight. And in order to create value on a continued basis, uh, the pandemic has uh, helped us learning that managing risk and forcing the risk is very, very important. I'm sure uh, 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 Chow, uh, Professor Shao has also uh, uh, you know, appreciated this uh, in his research and uh, definitely could share some views from his engagements uh, 
uh, uh, across various jurisdictions uh, as part of his research as to uh, what is the focus on value creation and what are the key challenges which the China perceives at the moment on this? Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Niraj. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. In a way, it's a soul-searching question. Uh, well, I, I started uh, st uh, research on corporate governance about 20 uh, years ago, well, more than 20 years ago. Well, back then, uh, the, the question about corporate governance uh, pretty much is about the question of maximization of shareholder wealth. Uh, so as long as, uh, well, agency costs, uh, the well-known agency costs, which uh, well, in different contexts it might mean the costs uh, of, uh, for the principal shareholders, for example, in a, uh, to really to hold their managers accountable in a, in a dispersed ownership structure, or in the case of China, uh, to somehow to hold the majority shareholder uh, accountable towards the minority shareholder, that was really the only question uh, that the people were concerned uh, with. But increasingly, I think, uh, uh, if you look around globally, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure this might well be the case in India, but this is certainly becoming the trend uh, in, uh, in in China uh, uh, too, uh, which is uh, board nowadays uh, is really facing a multitude of goals. Uh, so they are dealing, they, they have basically they have been expected to deal with uh, questions they, or maybe 20, 15 years ago, they have never been asked to do. Now, I can give you, a, well, it's a long list, but uh, nowadays, uh, this is, well, basically in front of me, we have a list of uh, questions that are, uh, I'm going to talk to senior director, independent directors, directors uh, in the UK, some uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the States, in China. This is a list of questions they say, well, they, they're, they're struggling to deal with. Uh, let me just say, start with from this. For example, you know, how do you, uh, as a board, uh, how do you create a company culture that support long-term value creation rather than short-term as the quarterly value creation? How do you uh, uh, how do you improve the diversity of the board, uh, for example? Uh, how do you uh, increase the diversity of the management team? Uh, how do you address uh, the ESG questions, um, sustainability questions? Uh, how do you enhance oversight of risk? How do you strengthen uh, the engagement uh, efforts with stakeholders, uh, especially the so-called uh, activist institutional shareholders? Uh, how do you deal with uh, proxy advisors? So these are just, um, this is just a, a very brief list of questions that are, um, you know, 20, 15 years ago, uh, board uh, members wouldn't bother to consider, but increasingly, uh, these are the questions that which are taking away, taking a lot of their attention. So I think these are the questions I, uh, well, uh, globally, uh, well, I, I think scholars, practitioners, uh, board members, independent directors, they're working together uh, to try and come up with some answer, uh, even though we're not, we're sure, uh, really, we, we don't really have a perfect answer for now. Great. So uh, thanks for sharing the, the, the list of the concerns which uh, the Chinese boards have. And I, I see um, the areas uh, of common interest to the Indian boards as well. Uh, these days, either we talk of long-term value creation or development of a corporate culture, which takes a long-termism approach rather than taking a short-termism approach. Uh, um, uh, but taking a lead from this, uh, specifically focusing the shareholder uh, value creation aspect, which uh, you have discussed. I would like to go back to Harpreet discussing, we often talk about the effectiveness of board. And uh, there are different theories, like uh, Shao has mentioned about agency problem and has mentioned about the shareholder value creation uh, theorem. Then there is a stakeholder value creation uh, theorem. So how can the effectiveness of the board be complete? Uh, uh, don't you think uh, uh, the effectiveness is complete when we look at uh, a uh, towards a more balanced approach having uh, stakeholders in the spotlight as well. Yeah, so uh, the effectiveness of board, uh, you know, it's a, it's actually it's a, a challenging question to you know, answer also because we need to first understand what are the factors which are impacting the effectiveness, right? And that brings us to the question that what has been the you know, uh, what has been the approach of the policymakers. And if you look into Indian context, and we'll find that, that the focus has been on legal and, you know, regulatory 
formalities for example what should be the you know gender balance on the board or what should be the board size or what should be the you know remuneration or what should be the for example the role of the chair of the board right but uh, but the but the effectiveness how it has to be actually measured is when we evaluate the performance right of the board and the concept of evaluation of the board came very late actually because 2013 companies had it to write for it and uh, you have already mentioned uh, you know, the code of conduct for independent directors and that kind of course uh, but uh, we were slow in taking it up and also i should also you know mention here that oecd had recommended uh, that you know we should have a board evaluation as a criteria for every country's corporate governance framework and in fact they said that it's a new paradigm which tasks the board with the uh, to evaluate its own performance as well as the performance of its directors and its you know committee right and taking then from here if we look into the increased complexity of the business the kind of uncertainties that we have faced in 2020 and opportunity and risks have always been there and also we have you know increased the stakeholder pressures so the long term value the short term performance we have you know institutional investors who are having you know increased focus on who is going to be in the board right and we sometimes we do have you know activist investors whereas in india it's you know it's not that you know we don't have those many activist investors but world around we see that right so the board evaluation actually becomes a tool for for the board you know, for the directors to review their performance and also improve uh, you know uh, improve uh, their performance for the future but then there will be certain lim limitations here some constraints also that we also need to you know keep in uh, keep in uh, you know our uh, you know discussion because we cannot always have the expectation but we don't you know bother about the limitations for example the limitation will be the how many times the board members they are meeting right what is the requirement of regular meetings um if you look into the provisions of the companies act the directors they are exercising their duties are of intermittent nature they are not expected to manage the affairs of the company if i go by the old you know city equitable you know fire insurance company case and i take the lead from there and if we have you know a large board size then also having a focused discussion with so many board members also sometimes may create uh, some problem then looking into the complexity of the information there may be data so complex data that you know all board members may not be in a position to comprehend that and take you know uh, you know suggest some informed decision on that especially for hong kong i remember uh, a company case that where they are depending upon you know ai for for the purpose of you know uh, suggesting a uh, you know an investment company that whether they should go for investment in a particular you know country or not and the data is all synthesized to the to the ai uh, you know software and also can we have lot uh, many board members there may be lack of cohesiveness in the decision making then there may be power structure also so dual positions in the management or in the board can be one of the areas and the relationship of the board with the management at one side and the relationship of the board the shareholders on the other hand right and also understanding the accountability so what is going to be the accountability of the you know board members i think all of them they have to be kept in mind when we are setting an expectation uh, over the board's performance and we are trying to measure the actually the effectiveness of the board and uh, you would agree to me that we had you know shared certain you know data and reports and the articles that we were reading together for this conference and it was very difficult for us to find that if there had been actually a an analysis of measuring the effectiveness of the board on a you know on a general scale yes few companies like fortune 100 companies 
for a few years their uh, performance has been evaluated, uh, but uh, a, a generic kind of study we could not uh, see. So I hope I answered your question, uh, Dr. Neeraj. Uh, great. So, uh, out of uh, a number of points which you have raised at past of the as part of the discussion, taking cue from it and uh, putting it sharp for, uh, you know, taking the discussion forward. What I understand is the effectiveness of the of the board uh, rests with uh, uh, performance evaluation for performance improvement on a continued basis. Uh, that's the key to uh, long termism approach and ensuring. Uh, the value creation aspect in the long term. Uh, taking uh, uh, the discussion forward on this, uh, how do you see, Professor Chow, uh, uh, Chinese uh, boards concerned about uh, uh, who needs to be uh, evaluated? Like, is it the entire board which needs to be evaluated? Or, uh, because this is a question which oftentimes comes to the minds of directors. So, uh, the board in entirety or the individual director should also be evaluated. So in terms of regulatory framework and the practices, uh, we would love to know your perspective. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Niraj. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a difficult question. Um, well, I can start with the Chinese approach, uh, and then very briefly, and then go into the comparative, uh, comparative experience. Now, the Chinese approach uh, is uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat rigid, uh, put it that way. Uh, and uh, let me just start by making this observation, which is I, I disagree with this approach uh, before I say uh, what the approach might be. Now, so under what well, the PRC, uh, the Chinese uh, overall uh, regulatory landscape, there's only one piece of regulation um, regulating the evaluation board members. Now that regulation is confined entirely to one sector, and that is the financial sector. So basically you have a piece of regulation which very specifically regulates how board members are evaluated by in banks and insurance companies. So these, these two, all right? Now, uh, if you go through this, uh, this, uh, this piece of legislation, what you see uh, somehow, there, there are two general observations. Number one is box ticking. Uh, so essentially, you have a long list of boxes, uh, such as whether there's, a, there's a, any compliance with regulation, whether there's any breaches of ethical code, etc. I can go through the, there's a long list which I don't want to go through. So essentially, what board members, they would be asked to tick all these boxes uh, and basically to hand this uh, survey, uh, survey reports uh, to, uh, to, the rec to what they call the supervisory board. Uh, as you probably would appreciate, in, on, in, on the Chinese company law, you have two layers of um, law of uh, board. You have a supervisory board, and then you have a management board. Essentially, it's called a board of director. And then hand it over to the supervisory board, and job is done. All right. So that's that's a rather tick box ticking board. That's number one. Uh, the first observation. Now the second observation is that well, uh, it's something which I, I echo what um, uh, what Harper has said, which is uh, you would have see. Uh, uh, almost um, a single-minded focus on compliance. Uh, so all these uh, box to be checked is really about compliance with laws, regulations, with uh, code of conduct, uh, with ethical code, uh, but has nothing, well, very little to do with a broader aspects uh, of uh, the role of a board, uh, which is, so this is what we have uh, in China. I think uh, what I, I might say is that well, uh, China is actually uh, also facing a rather steep learning curve when it comes to evaluation of the board, uh, as with many other jurisdictions. So this is about China. Uh, if that is uh, okay, I, I can move on very quickly uh, towards comparative experience. So we have, uh, I think I see it in the chat box as well. Uh, we have, uh, Harper and I, we, we, we have uh, done uh, a, a digging, a very careful digging, uh, there are a few reports uh, issued by I IFC, by OECD. Um, yeah. uh, uh, there are quite a few uh, recent reports uh, on possible approaches. Now, one of the questions, uh, uh, Dr. Niraj, as you put it uh, nicely, is who is to be evaluated? I think that the different approaches to it. Now, uh, the narrowest of approach, uh, if I may call it, uh, is executive directors. 
Now, essentially, you are looking at those directors who are, were basically participating in uh, in uh, in the corporate affairs day in and day out. Uh, so, you we are looking at evaluation of those uh, those decision makers. Um, well, as in some cases, is evaluation of uh, the CEO um, slash director. So that that is the narrowest of approach. Now, uh, then you have a, a some, somewhat broader approach, and uh, then you look at a, a evaluation of certain committees. Uh, you have evaluation of, in some cases, independent directors, and uh, the broadest approach would be evaluation of the whole of the full board. Now, that actually gives rise to you. Uh, that is, in a way, that is a, a, a easier question to answer uh, than the, the more difficult question, which is who to evaluate. Uh, those to be evaluated. Uh, for example, if you are you are evaluating executive directors, well, you might uh, imagine you might anticipate it would be let's say the lead independent director, uh, or let's say you know uh, the independent chairperson of the board uh, who will probably will be assigned that role. Now, but if you have the whole board evaluated, uh, then that will give rise to a very practical question as to who might be able to do that. Uh, but I, I should take a pause before I, uh, before I go on uh, into that question. Great. So, uh, uh, to my understanding, uh, uh, of course, the way uh, comparatives have been placed by you, I echo the same. Uh, it is not uh, mm -hmm. just the independent directors or the individual directors. Uh, in executive or non-executive categories, but also the ent entire board, which uh, needs to be evaluated. So one thing we need to be very clear in the same uh, sentiments has been echoed by the regulatory framework placed forward uh, in India. Now, as a next point, as you have very well mentioned about the uh, OECD, uh, uh, you know, guidance note and the framework, and also the IFC's framework, because uh, it is an agency which, uh, uh, which uh, you know, catalyzes on uh, movement of uh, funding in the private sector organizations across the world, and, and work uh, very closely uh, uh, with the with the industries. Uh, definitely, on second question, I would like to uh, go to uh, Harpreet, asking uh, uh, like how. How the evaluations needs to be conducted. Probably we will learn from Chow in the later stage. But uh, as uh, you are an expert on Companies Act and uh, SEBI uh, regulations, so there is a lot which has been mentioned, and there are areas which the companies have been given a, a, a you know a liberal uh, ecosystem to decide on how uh, they want to put this process in place. So uh, I would like to learn from you on two specific points. One, the key aspects of the regulatory framework on evaluation, and another, uh, another, uh, what should the board ideally focus on in terms of engaging with this process where they have a liberty to choose from, whether they will evaluate internally or they will engage an external agency uh, or third party or so. Over to Harpreet. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Neeraj. And, uh... So coming to uh, the provisions which are given by the Companies Act under Schedule 4, and uh, which is about code for independent directors. And if I read the point seven, uh, which talks about separate meetings by the independent directors, and uh, there should be at least one meeting in one financial year. And uh, there should not be any attendance of non-independent directors and members of management. That has been very clearly mentioned here. And the purpose of this meeting is performance review of non-independent directors and the board as a whole, the chairperson of the company, and also to assess the quality, quantity, and timeliness of flow of information from the you know, company, flow of information between company management and the and the board, and um, you know, which helps them uh, them in effectively and you know reasonably performing their duties. And the eighth point mentions that uh, there should be an uh, independent director's performance measurement, you know, evaluation, and this should be done by the entire board of directors, except the director being evaluated. Right. So, and then on the basis of this report of performance evaluation, it will be decided whether the 
you know uh, we we the company would like to continue with the independent director or not now uh, it's very well you know said by one of the learned uh, you know board members here that how do we understand this point that i am evaluating you and you are evaluating me right i practically speaking yes we will be in a you know fixed it will be in a fix how to do that but then we do have a guidance which has been provided to us by study which i'll i'll share with you in a minute that how we should design the evaluation process right and first i will cover these uh, technical like uh, regulatory points and then i will come to that uh, the guidance and uh, section 134 uh, says that you know the financial statements and board of report has to be submitted uh, you know by the board and uh, the in that uh, you know board's report there should be one statement by every listed company and other company who is having a minimum paid up capital of uh, 25 crores uh to give an statement that how there has been a formal annual evaluation of the performance of the board uh, its committees and individual directors so that uh, you know brings uh, a very clear indication here that who has to be evaluated the entire board has to be evaluated then individual directors have to be evaluated and also the committees of the board have to be evaluated but i would also bring in the the managerial personnel here who need to be evaluated because uh, when i look at uh, the sebi regulation so we do have uh, sebi listing obligations and disclosure requirements regulations 2015 which also give us information about the evaluation process and if you because since you are all very senior persons you must be knowing about clause 49 of the listing agreement and clause 49 gave spoke about voluntary board evaluation but this is not the case now under you know listing obligation requirements regulations in brief we call them lodr regulations and regulation 4 which talks about responsibilities of the board and it says it lays down one of the key functions of the board as monitoring and reviewing board board of directors evaluation framework so the review has it's the board's responsibility to also the monitor to monitor as well as to review the evaluation framework right and then regulation something further says that the evaluation of the independent director should be done by the entire board of directors so which involves two points the performance of the independent directors and also the fulfillment of the independence criteria right and and we also understand that 2013 act has also laid down this uh, you know uh, uh, responsibility or liability on the part of the independent directors also that if they incur any disqualification relating to their independence they have to you know indicate that in the first meeting of the board uh, in any financial year and that they have incurred the disqualification which is about their independence and whereas for other boards also other board members also apart from independent directors if they incur any disqualification they have to inform uh then schedule 2 uh of uh, this uh, lodr regulation speaks about the corporate governance and here it talks about the role of the nomination and uh, remuneration committee nrc and nrc also has to uh, you know look into the formulation of criteria for the performance of independent directors and also the schedule 5 also says that you know um, for you know there should be a corporate governance report where the evaluation criteria should be mentioned now so this was the regulatory uh, legal and regulatory framework now if you look at the evaluation process that how should we evaluate so as uh, dr neeraj and chau has discussed that you know first we should understand that when there should be evaluation what should be evaluated right and then who should conduct the evaluation and how the evaluation report should be discussed or disclosed so these are four important questions for now if i look into the sebi uh, 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 evaluation guidance which has been given by sebi in 2017 uh, they have also mentioned the subject of evaluation and uh, they have also mentioned that uh, you know that uh, what should be the process of evaluation what should be the objective of evaluation 
and uh, for uh, from my understanding uh, after reading this uh, i think that performance and effectiveness uh, of the board can be uh, you know worked on a four dimensions uh, their role in the monitoring and risk management and their role in the strategy and business their role in the composition and diversity maintaining composition and diversity diversity and when i when i say about diversity i mean two types of diversity one is the functional diversity and the second is you know the demographic diversity so uh, you know when i say functional diversity you know how many people from different educational backgrounds or skills we have on the board so i'm not only concerned about the demographic uh, diversity uh, then also the board dynamics and processes and what is included in that uh the the commitment of the board uh the information you know sharing of the board or the engagement of the board how well prepared the board members are uh at the time of the meetings the agenda sharing working on it all of them they become very important here the next question comes that you know who should conduct the evaluation and it has been very clearly mentioned that you know how it has who has to conduct the evaluation but here we can take assistance of third party evaluators also so we can have you know consultants uh, who will be neutral consultants and they can assist uh, us in having um, a kind of you know neutral assessment model because we have to prepare the questionnaire or the survey model or you know we can have interviews one to one and there can be you know 360 degree surveys where you know self assessment by the director has can also be included here so this is how we can you know go about uh, having uh, this kind of evaluation and please uh, we also need to keep this in mind that when we are evaluating somehow we need to understand the the shift the shift is from you know monitoring and oversight to a well balanced board a well balanced board which will add to you know which will work together with the management or the senior management and which will add to the you know innovation and strategy of the uh, to of for the for the long term you know value creation of the company so i think uh, this is what i can you know here say in brief if there will be further questions i will elaborate more on the sure sure uh, sure harpreet thanks uh, for sharing your perspectives and i understand just echoing and endorsing what you have just mentioned Uh, India is a country like United States and Spain, uh, which falls in the bucket uh, of the countries having a dedicated regulatory framework in place for board evaluation. I also understand at the same time what uh, Chao Professor Chao has uh, echoed that China is one unique case which does not have regulatory framework on board evaluation yet. I could understand that uh, a significant amount of appreciations towards this must be there. on uh, case to case basis by the companies which are uh, which are progressing and wants to adopt the global best practices in spite of the um, absence of a dedicated regulatory framework now uh, uh, in terms of what is to be evaluated and how it is to be done as you have mentioned i would like to add just one point with your uh, permission uh, uh, it's a very of course in india and companies act and uh, sebi uh, as you have beautifully and very sharply uh, mentioned uh, has uh, the process uh, what what is to be evaluated who is to be evaluated how is to be evaluated that is all there as part of the framework yet i would like to place its more objective exercise which uh, needs to be conducted by placing the soul rather than having a tick box approach that evaluation has been conducted because the evaluations not only helps us looking back in terms of the engagement of the board on various issues but also the engagement and the intensity of engagement by individual directors at the same time i feel it also it also helps the entire board to chalk out a action plan and a strategy as to how the same board could be more Uh, made more effective in future in the interest of the company and interest of all uh, stakeholders it also provides an opportunity to look at the skill based metrics uh, and and realize 
by the entire board what are the skills which are absent in the board and to address that gap by inducting uh, more directors or maybe in some cases uh, replacement but again uh, a point uh, which i personally believe as as a uh, you know mix of professional both academic and uh, practice perspectives that one should uh, one should view uh, one should view it as an exercise uh, which of course uh, gives us an opportunity to comply with the regulations but also uh, gives us an uh, opportunity to uh, use it as a feed forward for better actions and improvising the corporate governance standards in the company now if i go to professor chao i would like to learn very uh, uh, very quickly uh, uh, like what are the four five key areas where evaluation needs to be uh, uh, to be conducted to be more focused and uh, just two three uh, quick points as to uh, what should be the methodology should it be a 90 degree appraisal should it be based on some well developed questionnaire should it be 360 degree where one each one of the members of the board evaluate the self and then others evaluate uh, with a uh, with a uh, you know a final group discussion on the churn of it to take uh, to develop an action plan so what are your uh, what is your take on it professor chao well it's a, it's a it's a great question it's a great question now uh, the topics uh, is uh, what to well, the answer may sound a bit uh, abstract, but uh, the topics are actually very company specific. Now, for example, uh, if a company which is running into a major ESG, let's say sometimes they call it a PR crisis, then really the, the primary objective of that kind of company would be really be, you know, what are weaknesses? Uh, what are the perceived weaknesses in the board decision making process, which have really led us to this uh, situation where ESG issues were, were simply either ignored or really not taken to the heart of the board deliberation? Now, sometimes there could be a diversity issue. You know, you have major, maybe the big four, big uh, three, or those uh, institutional investors, they may raise concern as to, you know, um, diversity issues. And the objective will be really to address that kind of uh, question. Now, uh, having said that, having said it in, in a very general uh, manner, generic manner, I would say, you, you know, there's, there's some issues which, uh, which uh, this is a report, which I, I will just read it out, uh, which, Typically, uh, the questions that will be considered. Um, number one, board composition. Number two, uh, direct independence, especially how directors represent the interest of uh, significant shareholders or the founding families. Number two, uh, meeting the information processes. Number four, the quality of the board uh, boardroom discussions. Number five, succession strategy. Number six, a relationship board relationship management. So these are the, the, the so-called typical question, typical uh, effectiveness questions uh, to be considered. I'm not sure whether I would answer your question. Yeah, definitely these are the points. And uh, another part of the question, if you quickly would like to share, uh, as to how mm, the entire process of uh, uh, evaluating the board and the directors be carried out. So what, what do you suggest, an interview-based approach or a questionnaire-based approach or a group discussion-based approach and how the areas need to be jotted down so that it... Uh, it serves as part of the agenda in the board meeting uh, to deliberate uh, as to how the existing levels of performance could be taken to the next level. So some quick points from you. Sure. Um, empirically, uh, we have uh, looked into the study of uh, Fortune of uh, Fortune 100 companies. Uh, yes. So for those companies which make made disclosure of their uh, evaluation processes, uh, it appears to be the case that uh, qu questionnaire-based uh, evaluation is used much more frequently than interview-based uh, evaluation. So that's, uh, I think that's a, a one of the observations which have been made, and that's number one. Number two, when it comes to questionnaire-based uh, um, evaluation, uh, one of the key issues, practical issues, I think some of our, our particip learning the participants are, are asking this practical uh, perspective of, of, uh, of the process, uh, which is those questionnaire questions, typical, those questions uh, need to be designed very carefully, need to be crafted very carefully uh, so as to encourage a candid 
honest self-reflection. Uh, so th this is a question which was used as an example of a bad quest uh, question, all right? I can read it out, uh, which this is a question which doesn't really uh, inspire any self-reflection. Uh, it says, the question is this, which is, does the board ensure superior operational execution by the management? Now, so this is a question which is um, profoundly, uh, you know, generic, which doesn't really ask uh, any good reflection. So the advice uh, which has been given uh, by uh, one of the practical studies is to try to be asked, try to ask questions to the point, uh, especially questions which are really relevant to the current issue faced by the company concerned. Uh, so the device here is really you need to update the questionnaire on a day, year by year or sometimes semi year by year basis so that the questionnaire remains relevant uh, to the company. So that's uh, for the questionnaires. Uh, for the interviews, I think this is a question asked by some of your participants. Uh, one, one of the lessons to be learned uh, is that well, the, 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 it's really important to identify uh, a interviewer who, uh, who, is, uh, who is trusted, uh, you know, with uh, confidential information. Uh, so that person uh, could be, uh, let's say, somebody who is not within the company, not already in the board, but is widely respected, with a reputation to be neutral, uh, to be impartial. Um, so somebody probably of, uh, enjoys a, a high senior status, let's say a retired uh, government official with a good reputation. Uh, alternatively, it has been suggested, it could be a, pro a practitioner uh, working for a senior practitioner, say a partner working for a proxy advisor. Uh, or other you know, professional uh, service provider, uh, somebody who is trusted by, uh, by the community of directors. Uh, so that's a, these, are, these are the takeaways uh, that we, Harper and I, we have managed to get uh, from uh, a good number of studies. Yeah. Great. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, if, yeah. Leaders, if you permit me here, I would like to add here that you know, uh, the entire board has to sit together because it's the responsibility which has been, you know, driven vice versa. So you have to evaluate me, I have to evaluate you. Right, so and the entire board should sit together, objectively work on the questionnaire, because this is the exercise which we academicians always do for our performance evaluation. Chow would agree to it, because we have to regularly face performance, you know, evaluation. And we work on those questions because we don't want any subjectivity to be there in the in the questions and how the answers have to the options have to be framed you know whether there should be a scale of options you know uh, you know that that's a huge exercise that every researcher also you know does one who goes for such kind of qualitative analysis so that if entire board sits together objectively look into the parameter you know, spend some time on deciding the question and the, the and then be honest in your answers that's also important be honest in your answers also so i think that is the way in which the board can work together at the end of the day i i, I said that you know there is a focus towards having a well balanced you know boards no longer the monitoring or you know oversight uh, you know, you know emphasis regulatory emphasis right so i think both can you know they can sit together and work on it i mean that's what is my you know expectation that can be no that's a uh, that's a very uh, that's a very interesting point you have added uh, to the discussion which professor chow has put forward uh, uh, the board uh, factually is a team and if we look at uh, you know it's a common sentiment and an objective of each of the member of the board to take the level of governance and the performance of the company up and up every time. So uh, the exercise uh, needs to have its own uh, spine, uh, needs to have its own soul as well. The, the, the detailing, uh, detailing on various critical aspects, as Professor Chow has mentioned, like uh, that may vary from industry to industry. So it's a uh, exercise requiring a lot of detailing understanding the the areas of concern areas of strength as well as areas of opportunities and then uh, developing a detailed questionnaire uh, uh, so that a more intensive engagement uh, could be initiated for reviewing the performance of 
the entire board as well as all the directors and as we understand from uh, the framework in place as well as the best practices like ifc board evaluation framework it's not uh, uh, you know evaluation by others like it starts from self evaluation and then uh, once you evaluate yourself on those parameters of course we can use some likert scale or uh, some other scale for that particular point uh, there is always a uh, you know 180 degree and then later 360 degree evaluation which uh, you might conduct it in uh, you know a delphi way as well uh, to keep it more blind and objective and sharp uh, so that you know the churn of the discussion comes as to what are the areas which requires more focus and if we look at uh, this is factually an exercise Uh, uh, for identification of opportunities, not identification of the areas where someone or the other has not performed. So it's not a blame game exercise. It needs to be viewed as a more positive exercise and uh, a positive feedback for improvising further. One more point which I would like to add, uh, uh, taking cue from the check uh, tick box approach, which is uh, not one of the concern of Professor Chow or Harpreet. rather in literature both in research as well as uh, speeches from the practitioners that the corporate governance standards in any country can be uh, you know improved if we move beyond the tick box approach and uh, and understand the real plight and spirit of the regulations or the code of conduct and the requirement of the industry because it's a very competitive world the the pandemics have also arrived adding up to the level of existing socio economic or technology based risks which the companies face so considering this uh, it should not just be limited to the number of board meetings or the committee meetings a particular director has attended and considering if it, if uh, he has attended 100% the evaluation is the best it it requires more qualitative aspects to come in uh, picture Uh, in terms of ratings in a more objective manner in a more uh, uh, you know honest manner and also uh, working together rather than gratifying each other during the evaluation process and that's the reason uh, you know uh, there are companies in india uh, as well as other jurisdictions specifically the fortune 500 companies who engage an expert agency on this because that uh, you know the way it details and the kind of experience of the good practices it brings in in developing that questionnaire either for issue to be issued for circulation or uh, the questions to form part of the interviews or the discussions is very very important so i think uh, this is something we need to uh, learn from this now moving on to the uh, the uh, the concluding aspect uh, of course uh, as uh, professor harpreet has mentioned about uh, Uh, the sebi's framework and companies act framework which speaks about giving feedback back to the directors as to how they have performed what has been adjusted by the board and 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 developing an action plan articulating the skill gap articulating the resource requirement the training requirement the exposure requirement and so on and so forth so what best you suggest harpreet uh, 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 on this uh, needs to be focused more of course we all can read the guidance note from the sebi or the guidance note from ifc and oecd this is all available in the public domain but uh, yeah, just yeah. two three quick expert points on this as to how the action plan uh, uh, should have a focus so that uh, the the inputs of this could be used to enhance the output yeah so you know uh, i would only say this point here that whenever we you know you, we do any any research we first you know focus on that what are the objectives right and under those each objective what is going to be my you know outcome expected outcome and you know so here all uh, as uh, you know we know that what has to be evaluated and you know what is the need for evaluation right and on the basis of that evaluation we frame our questionnaires and we frame our you know uh, the process of evaluation in the sense that you know whether i'm looking at structure of the board or or uh, you know meetings of the board whether i'm looking at functions of the board or i'm looking at relations between board and management 
or whether I'm looking at the past performance of the company or I want to focus on, you know, the future the performance of the company. So all that had to be first laid down and then accordingly we frame our you know questions that how we can you know get the outcome the desired result. So we sometimes we we call it you know don't put leading questions that where you get the same you know answer expected answer so that you are leading the you know the the person who is giving the the who is asking the question has the same answer that you expected. Right. And then so after that, the important will be now the questionnaire has been framed and it has been discussed with everyone. Everyone is satisfied. The questionnaire questionnaires have been filled by everyone. And then we analyze that the result. You know, analysis of the result becomes very important. And on the basis of analysis, we have to give feedback. And we have to say that the feedback is not to negate the performance or the role of anyone. We don't have to demotivate people. We have to see that the feedback, which is a kind of, you know, a positive feedback, you know, where we are moving. So the giving the feedback and on the basis of the, the feedback, because there is a disclosure requirement also. So after the feedback, we have to prepare a report that how we disclose it. So all that exercise has to be, I think, objectively done and the responsibility board as a whole should take the responsibility of you know uh, completing this process objectively because it's not for the compliance purposes that we are doing so it's not tick box it's not the compliance requirement it is for the well-being of my company it is for the sustenance of my company it is for the sustenance of all the employees of the company and it is also for me my sustenance as a board member in the company right so what has been my contribution i should be worried about this right so that this full exercise should be done by a board as a as a team as you said and objectively evaluate it and it should be a it should be a regular process it should not be a piecemeal exercise it has to be a regular exercise and you know everybody should positively uh, you know um, uh, accept the outcomes of this exercise and because if you do this regularly we have seen this as an academician that there is consistent you know improvement in the performance consistent improvement Right, so that's what I, I can, you know, suggest. Uh, great. So, uh, so uh, the crux of the discussion is that uh, uh, the focus should be on the analysis of the entire uh, rigorous exercise. Uh, then it needs to be done uh, in continuity rather than having it as a, a random exercise. Uh, so a frequency needs to be set. Uh, the learnings needs to be extracted and uh, the action plans needs to be developed in terms of the emerging areas to be focused individually as well as collectively and the resources uh, which is required in addition to this just one point if you uh, please allow i would like to add um, the owners of different action agendas also needs to be fixed uh, uh, you know in the board meeting as to who uh, who is responsible for taking mm -hmm. it further or who is responsible for providing those those resources and who needs to focus on what and and it needs to be taken in uh, in well and, and good spirits uh, professor chao before we close uh, uh, just one final point one final message from from your side uh, as to uh, uh, you know what should be uh, is there any area left out for uh, uh, you know from the action plan which you would like to insist upon or underline uh, I might just add uh, leadership. That's something which uh, is also very important. You Beautiful. need the leadership yeah. in overseeing the process, seeing through from the concept contempla contemplation to execution to analysis to transparent disclosure and transparency action plan. So you need a strong leadership to see this through and a cooperation uh, by the more board members to be evaluated. Great. So I'm just uh, uh, I'm thankful for, uh, you know, this point on leadership and would like to connect back uh, with the initial point uh, you made at the beginning of the session. See, uh, corporate governance is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, contingent upon 
a positive culture uh, within the board and the company and, and the culture uh, uh, culture gets fine tuned with the good leadership so in terms of board evaluation the leadership should realize and appreciate the importance of such exercise and they should set a tone at the top uh, uh, by setting up a culture of evaluation, not considering it as an exercise to pass or fail, which we normally find in academics and classes, uh, rather an exercise uh, to graduate forward. So it's not a, you know, a pass or fail exercise, but something to graduate to the next level. And that requires the support of a, a you know, favorable culture and a strong leadership and message coming out of the leadership. So with this, I would like to close this discussion on some key points where we tried, uh, uh, you know, to discuss on uh, right from the regulatory framework to uh, the um, uh, what, how, uh, when, and, and why of uh, um, uh, this board evaluation, which is of course an emerging area for the country as well. India being a rule driven, uh, uh, you know, ecosystem. Uh, we are not code-based uh, 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 ecosystem where uh, many of the countries work. So it's much more mandatory and often misused as a tick box exercise, which we have already discussed need not to be taken as an ideal case. Now, I would like to open the floor, helping the participants to take advantage of the expertise both of you have uh, and, and, and ask some questions. So uh, I would request those who have a question can switch on their camera and raise their hand so that my team can allow you one by one uh, for raising these questions and we can accommodate easily five to six questions, I hope. Yes, sir, Dr. Uh, Dr. Anupam. You can switch on your mic, sir. Uh, well, thank you for, you know, this interesting uh, talk on discussion on evaluation of boards. Anything that we are evaluating can only be evaluated for the purpose for which it was meant. And if we really look at companies, companies exist because there are customers. And without customers, no company will exist. And I think Peter Drucker has made the point that the purpose of business is to serve the needs of the customer. And at the end of the day, it is the role of the board to ensure that the business model that you create and that you are implementing is relevant to serve the needs of the customer, remains viable and remains ethical. And so therefore, isn't it important that we have an ethical framework to ask while evaluating, saying, that, is this company having a business model that is both ethical and viable and is serving the needs of the customer? So I think okay. if we miss this, then we have really missed the core of what needs to be evaluated. So that's really uh, my comment. Maybe you want to right. comment on it. Sure. Uh, so uh, uh, who would like to address Professor Chao or uh, Professor Harpreet? Any I, I comments on this? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree to you, Dr. Anupam, because uh, when I was mentioning that objectivity, I was also including the, you know, including the point of ethics there, because, you know, it's at the end of the day, uh, you know, if, you know, the, the reputation of a company is very important, right? And, and if the rep there is harm to the reputation, definitely you are going to lose on your business. So for you, your customers are important and customers would definitely like to, you know, go with the company which has been, you know, uh, which has imbibed ethical values in its management and the board. And in fact, like when we look into the, you know, uh, 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 the performance evaluation of the management itself, ethical, you know, ethics and values became the, you know, become the first point to, you know, manage uh, uh, this and, but, there is uh, another view also that uh, you know at, uh, you know customers are okay one you know your stakeholders of the business but then for the shareholders also you have to work so a fine balance has to be maintained by the by the board that we are not we are, we are not move, moving you know in one direction to give benefit all the benefit to shareholders and do not look at you know 
the shareholder uh, do not look at the customers and the and the value that we create as a board itself. Great. Uh, so I just if you allow, if you allow, uh, Professor Harpreet, I would like to add two quick points before we move on to the next question. Uh, in response to Dr. Anupam, uh, 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 profits are nothing but uh, the reward from the stakeholders to the company for doing great things. So, but profits are viewed in a different way. So, definitely, it articulates the importance of customers as well as other stakeholders. And on the point of ethics and inclusivity on various aspects, definitely, board evaluation has two aspects: the evaluations of the directors individually who may not impact the approach of the company towards the excellence in addressing to the customer issues as far as right from the design of a product to delivery and uh, and and post sales service it is the board collectively which has to address this so uh, while evaluating the board and jotting the uh, jotting down the points and detailing aspect as we were discussing we need to consider various uh, stakeholders and should try to capture the level of uh, their expectations and then try to uh, you know place uh, points as to what extent we have addressed them so this will automatically involve uh, customers as well and as uh, harpreet has very beautifully pointed out objectivity involves object we talked about objectivity and honesty so that involves the ethical frontier where you need to be open you need to be ethical in terms of uh, assessing oneself, assessing others, and taking participation in assessing the entire board. So please allow me to move on to the next question by uh, by uh, Mr. Anil Goel. Goel, sir, would you like to uh, ask a question? Mr. Goel, you have a question? Okay, in the meantime, he uh, uh, switches on his mic. Uh, can I go to uh, Ms. Sadhana Rao for her question? Sadhana, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, good evening, panelists and participants. My question here was that, are there any authorized agencies to develop these questionnaires for an evaluation? How can one make the evaluation process Foolproof, foolproof for effectiveness of the entire process. Uh, Professor Chow, do you have? Uh, uh... Yes, uh, I suppose it's going to be market specific. Uh, I wouldn't be able to comment on India, uh, but in the US, uh, you see uh, a, a, a two very important sources of supplier of, uh, of those questionnaires are uh, one proxy advisor. Uh, who obviously engage in corporate governance, uh, evaluation of uh, boards and the directors uh, on a frequent basis, so first of all. Uh, secondly, uh, those big accountancy firms uh, which uh, provide consultancy services, uh, which has got a track record of providing consultancy services. Uh, so these are two sources of providers um, in the U.S. market uh, boards and directors they typically tap into. Do we have uh, agencies in India, Dr. Gupta? Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to address to what uh, Madam Rao has asked. Uh, see, almost as, as Professor Chow has mentioned, uh, like in India, mm, there are, uh, uh, you know, consulting firms as well as the executive uh, search firms who engage with the leadership and board practices. So the firms who have these board practices, vertical uh, and including IIC as well, of course, I don't want to promote the institution. Uh, uh, so you need to understand whosoever, uh, either executive search firms or big fours or big eights who have board advisory vertical and, and services can help the institutions in terms of understanding their needs or evaluation uh, by way of uh, you know a two-way approach. One, the kind of practice on board evaluation they have in, uh, at the moment, uh, including looking at the board evaluation policy because each and every company has that policy and disclose that policy. And another, uh, what could be the fine tuning which can be done to that, including the detailing, not just developing the questionnaire, but objectively conducting that process to ensure that there is no conflict of interest. So uh, you can take help of this. Now, if you allow, I would like to uh, move on to another question uh, by Mr. Sanjay Sarda. Sanjay, can you ask your question? Thank you. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. 
Yes, now I can unmute myself. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, mostly it is guided that uh, one board member is evaluating other board member and vice versa. So how do we expect that uh, it will be a neutral evaluation or a real evaluation? Because if I give wrong points or negative points to other, probably the other person will give the negative points to me. So what Sanjay, all precautions uh, can be taken? Sanjay, your question, uh, your question uh, really alarms me. Uh, do we really work in such an insecure and uh, uh, you know environment in our uh, professional lives? Yes, at least uh, I don't think personally that uh, we look at the things this way. So it's not always that the blind reviews are required, even in the exposed reviews or in the open reviews. Uh, what is expected out of the duty of care and duty of loyalty, which is expected across all jurisdictions from all board members, is to think honestly, objectively in the interest of the company and to respond, object, question, uh, evaluate in a more objective manner. So I think the one who is really fit to become an independent director would not hesitate in terms of sharing the true and fair uh, picture of self-evaluation, he needs to be courageous enough to evaluate oneself and say that, look, out of the 10 marks, I could secure only 4.5 or 5 or 6 in this, uh, in this year. Next year, I will try to upgrade it and take it to the level 9. So if we have that courage, if we have that objectivity for evaluating oneself, I'm sure that if objectivity we will also put in place while evaluating others. Now, if any of my panelists would like to add some point to this. Yeah, yeah. I would uh, like to add to what Dr. Neeraj has said that, you know, once we do the analysis and we share the feedback, then we go for training also for that. You know, that will be the action plan, how to improve. You know, that, that is what is required to be done by the, you know, the leadership and also, there is always a learning from the peer review process. So one has to be open for such kind of learning. And that's what, you know, we as academicians, you know, we learn from each other. We review each other's work and we, you know, give open comments and we, we improve ourselves. So we should be open for such kind of peer review learning also. Thank you, Arpreet. Now I'm moving on to the next question by uh, uh, Mr. Mittal. Can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Anil Mittal, you have a question? Mr. Anil Mittal, do you have a question, sir? I think he is not ready with the question. Can I move on to Mr. Bharat Bhushan? Unmute yourself, please, sir. Mr. Bharat Bhushan. Yeah, sir. Good afternoon and uh, thanks for this opportunity. I have a very uh, specific question, sir. Uh, up till now, what we are seeing how the board is being managed in India. And, and we always think about that regulatory aspect, like uh, tick boxes. We have done this, we have done this, we have done this. And excellence is something which uh, requires us to move beyond regulation. Like uh, somebody has to look, uh, it's, it's not only the compliance aspect. Actually, we are actually trying to achieve some excellent aspect. And what we are discussing about board evaluation is all about that. So my question is to any of the two panelists, like uh, what is the ev evolution process? Like when are we going to reach to that level, especially for Indian corporates, wherein you know, we can get uh, that kind of excellence, wherein we are not just looking after complying things, complying section 135 or co complying something else. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, before uh, uh, before uh, uh, you know the mic goes to the panelists, I would just like to uh, you know, uh, uh, reflect with very one very sharp statement, uh, rather two statements. We are in the management and governance, yet not managing everything. Uh, you know, so uh, it's not like every board is for a toss and being managed. So I completely disagree with this statement. And second point is before looking at the practices and uh, looking at the gaps, uh, the first thing which I personally feel as an independent director, we need to be true in uh, ourselves and as I mentioned during the last workshop, we need to have that courage, we need to have that confidence and character and capability. I'm sure if all boards are filled with the, these kinds of, uh, uh, you know, spirits, nothing can be managed. Now, I would like to pass on the mic to uh, any of the panelists who would like to take an opportunity. Hafra, go ahead. I might just chip in. Okay. 
Yeah, so uh, we do have something known as self-regulation and we do have self-regulatory, you know, organizations also. So it's not that that we in, uh, we began with the, you know, legal and regulatory compliance. We had everything on voluntary basis also. So as I told you that clause 49 was voluntary. It spoke about voluntary board evaluation, right? Self-regulation we had for a number of years. But sometimes what happens that looking into the, you know, when we when there is more economic development, more money is involved, more FDI is coming up, different types of businesses are established, different types of, you know, business organizations are establishing. We are covering, you know, not only the partnerships, but we are talking about public private partnerships. So when we come up with these you know, evolving type of, you know, system, legal system as well as business models. We need to have somebody to tell us that where we are going wrong, right? So having some regulation or compliances, I don't think so is bad at all. But yes, overly engaging into the legal and regulatory framework is def definitely not desirable. Right. So if I have to for everything, whatever I'm doing in a business house, I have to, you know, submit the report immediately and not I have to submit the report to, you know, ROC, but I have to submit the report to CCI also. Then I have to submit the report to CB also. You know, there can be a system that we we have regulatory coordination. Now the technology gives us this opportunity to work towards regulatory coordination. One simple form, fill all the information, information reaches all the regulators. And if they have their questions, they can come back to us. So at least the life of the of the management and the business will be, you know, to certain extent, you know, be better, right? Because Check mark, check mark, doing this, and actually we are not doing this. But when we see that, okay, one form has to be filled, yeah, income tax will be, this will go to the income tax department also. Everything will be taken care of. We'll be very careful in managing this work. I'm, I'm sure you may think that I am like very enthusiastic and very, you know, thinking this way, but this is what I have understood because I teach everything and when I teach, I, I get tired of telling my students what are the compliances required. A simple merger and acquisition, three places you have to go. Right, and three different criteria, NCLT approval, internal approval, general meeting approval, NCLT approval, then CCI approval. Right, and then there may be reference by to uh, any other statutory authority also. So I think that you know, there is a need for self-regulating also, and there is a need for a regulatory coordination also. That's what is my opinion. Uh, just one, uh, uh, just one quick point, and uh, I would like to add her here. Uh, compliances uh, needs to be viewed positively, and I view compliances as the face mask. You know. Uh, but if you really have to be uh, safe from uh, the risk of uh, this or any sort of pandemic, uh, it's it's always required to go beyond developing work-life balance during uh, developing, uh, you know, well-being and, and uh, taking a very healthy approach, including the social distancing. So uh, it's not just a question of containing oneself within uh, the cover of the compliance, uh, and not facing any penalty or, uh, uh, you know, any action from uh, any of the regulatory bodies, but also to make us uh, make our immunity better by going a step forward so that we can sustain our business models uh, could uh, stay relevant and we remain in business uh, rather than uh, being part of the bandwagon of the companies who have vanished over a period of time because of the poor governance practices. So uh, I am moving on to next question by uh, 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 Mr. Harinder Krishnan. Mr. Krishnan, can you hear me? You have a question? I think uh, there is no question, Mr. Uh, Mr. R. P. Singh Saab, you have a question, Mr. R. P. Singh. I can see you. Do you have a question, sir? Okay. Uh, let me move on to uh, Pradeep. Do you have a question? Uh, can you please unmute yourself? Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sure. 
Yeah. See, the role of independent director or non-executive director is to play role at the board, and the, the they, they question the assumptions of the management team, and they are not in day-to-day -day running of the management team. Now, to evaluate their contribution is very subjective issue. A person may speak the least at the board, and he may suggest one or two things, which really help the company or management start thinking. Instead of asking 100 questions at the board meeting, the person who's asked two questions can contribute much. Now, how do you evaluate this very, very subjective issue? And we are I'm mixing up with the management or uh, uh, the responsibility and the non-executive board's responsibility. Uh, Professor Chow, would you like to come on this? Uh, I will give it to Harpreet uh, for this one. Uh, I can I add. OK, so. Uh... What I would uh, suggest here that, uh, you know, management has to be kept separate from the board, you know, and uh, we understand that if you look into the conventional corporate governance system like we have in India, so the power or authority moves from shareholders to the board and to the from the board to the management, right? And management is responsible towards the board and board is responsible towards the the shareholder. So we we have to keep this in mind that what is the you know system we have uh, in a uh, in the conventional system that we have been uh, we we are in. So the evaluation of board will be different from the evaluation of the of the management. Now we do have you know key managerial personnel and senior management also. There may be some people who are having you know uh, a, a dual position. And, and I know that we are closely held, most of the companies, even the listed companies are closely held companies. So there we have to be very careful uh, that the, you know, when when I say independent board, I, I say that independent board keeps the company and the insiders away from each other. So it's a wedge in between, right? Similarly, it is also a wedge between the securities market and also, you know, short term investors, those who want to make money out of the company and quickly leave the company. Right. So these are the things which which are there as a fundamental to to Indian jurisdiction and for that matter to other jurisdictions also that we have to accept that this is the reality. And with this reality in mind, we have to frame uh, you know, our evaluation process. So the wholehearted effort of even the independent directors is required. Right. So I think that that's that's not something that we, we cannot do. And 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 in, for Indian jurisdiction, I understand this point that there is over emphasis on the role of independent directors. I know that, and we expect a lot of, you know, uh, you know, the wedging kind of, you know, relationship that they are able to monitor and, you know, keep the, in, you know, self-dealing transactions away from the company interest. So I know that this is this is the requirement, but at the end of the day, we have to be reasonably, we have to be reasonable in our expectations from the independent directors also, right? Even if we go for, you know, legal analysis, you know, the courts, they, and even for the common law jurisdiction also, we, we always go by what a reasonable man of, you know, this prudence will do in this particular situation, right? And if an independent director in that particular situation, that his expertise has taken the decision what a reasonable man of his standing would do in that particular circumstance. We give all the, you know, clearance to the independent director. So we don't think that they are, you know, something, you know, aliens or they will do, you know, something you know, very great to the company. We have to be reasonable over the expectations. And, and I think that, you know, that also sets the ground to that how we set our evaluation mechanism or the parameters. Yeah, but my question was not on the role of the non-executive director or independent director. The question is, there are all statutory provisions that they have to prevent insider trading. Insider trading regulations are very strong, etc. But how do you evaluate the contribution of a non-executive director? That, that's the issue. That the statutory provisions are all there. 
and what yeah. is the goal ask... and what is the obligation? But how do you evaluate his contribution? That's the issue. Uh, uh, Pradeep, uh, may I come in on this? Uh, if Arpreet allows, yes, sir. Uh, I would like to uh, come on this. See, uh, uh, I would like to say two points. Uh, in terms of evaluating the personalities, I'm sure you must be aware of uh, tests like uh, Briggs and Myers, uh, uh, which understands the psychometrics and all. When it comes to the evaluation of boards and specifically the non-executive uh, directors, which you are focusing how to evaluate, of course, no such Briggs and Myers kind of framework which has emerged, and that could not emerge because uh, you know, countries are different in terms of their socio-economic and techno uh, environment and ecosystem. And even within the country, different industries have different sorts of challenges where the independent directors or non-executive board members have to engage and contribute. So coming specifically and in a very sharp manner uh, uh, to your question, there are always, of course, once your company would engage us, uh, uh, we would be able to elaborate uh, in a more, uh, you know, with all the detailings. But I would place the evaluation in three buckets. The first bucket, uh, and this is, uh, you know, an outcome of uh, understanding of different frameworks in place. You talk of OECD, you talk of IFC, you talk of NACD, USA, and so on and so forth. So the first bucket uh, goes to the personal concerns or you can say the personal attributes where we uh, where we evaluate in terms of thought process we evaluate in terms of mindsets we evaluate in terms of uh, team behavior or working with the team we evaluate in terms of relationships we evaluate in terms of uh, you know on on various personal parameters uh, relating to or, 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 or uh, you know, focused on the personality of an independent director and the way uh, his personality has contributed in the board. Then the second bucket uh, where I would like to uh, mention is the structural concerns, uh, uh, not only testing from one side of the table, uh, but also from both sides of the table as to how much uh, the independent director has a, a appreciation towards his loyalty of care and because you were mentioning about insider trading uh, loyalty of uh, you know duty of care and duty of loyalty and how uh, the assurances from the non-executive position holders have been placed on this how are their understanding on the regulatory frameworks how are their understanding on the current uh, status of uh, compliance and going beyond by the company towards these regulated frameworks and how is their understanding towards the emerging best practices and sensitizing the board raising that in terms of questions before the board uh, challenging the board and questioning the board why something is not being accepted which is being followed by a lot many good companies so this could be the second bucket where a lot of detailing and lot of questions could come up and questions uh, should be ideally I i'm sure the the uh, my friends would agree questions should ideally be cross cutting you know where the bias and error factor in terms of the responses could also be figured out by putting statistical techniques into place if company really want to or the external agency really want to uh, engage with that sort of expertise and that sort of capability then the third bucket which i uh, you know place the evaluations and questions is relating to business to what extent the non executive position holders come with the background or understanding in terms of that specific business uh, in which the company is then how much uh, you know stretching one has done over a period of time in understanding it better uh, comprehending it better uh, deliberating discussing it better and 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 posing challenges before the team members and the entire board deliberating the issues which fine tune the existing processes it involves understanding on business models it involves understanding on uh, formulating or exec executing a strategy. It involves understanding on the present and the prospective risks. It understands the invest uh, and understanding on 
the sources of finance and the capital and their effective utilization. And as Dr. Anupam has mentioned, also involve understanding about different stakeholders, including the customers, as well as the likely shape in line with the vision which the company wants to take. So within the business bucket, it could also be tested how much the non-executive position holder is aligned with the, the purpose of the company the vision of the company and mission of the company and how much, uh, you know, in terms of sentiments, in terms of discussions, he has really helped the peer members to understand it better, discuss it much better and bring things in play, place so that it should be more sharper, it should be more focused, it needs to be more objective and it should be, uh, you know, uh, have a centricity towards the purpose of that specific company. So uh, the evaluation is a very exhaustive exercise as we three were focusing on. And I, I give you the hints of these three buckets. Definitely more detailing can be offered. And that's the role of an external agency to come and to offer those specialized things which uh, neutrally, uh, you know, the members or the board collectively may not look into. So that's the value uh, it can bring in and, and, and really help you adopting the practices in a much effective way. So that's my take on it, Pradeep. I hope I answered your question. Thank yep. you so much. Any any more questions? Uh, Sadhana, we already uh, done with your question. I'm sorry, uh, you will get chance in another. If uh, now I'm taking a final question from Mr. Subramaniam, who is waiting since long. And after that, we will cl uh, close with a word of thanks. Uh, Mr. Subramaniam, quickly, very yeah. sharp, very quick, very brief. Sorry, quick uh, question. Two things considering that you know the SEBI is contemplating uh, ESOPs to be given, I think whatever we have discussed in terms of board evaluation is very much in order and I think it should be done. My suggestion could be that just like you have a KPI in the initial, in the first year, it's sort of the beginning of the year, I think you should evaluate a KPI for all the board, entire board, depending upon where the company is and which company it is, which sector it is representing. So maybe a third party independent source should evolve a KPI at the end of the year and then have a mid-course evaluation, just to you do a mid-term evaluation, have some counseling sessions, and towards the end, again, do an evaluation. And that evaluation matrix should be kept for the purpose of any action plan for the future. These are my suggestions. Uh, thank you, Subramaniam, uh, for your suggestions. I completely agree with the aspect of KPI. And I understand that uh, the companies which are well governed set the KPIs and, and review the KPIs on a quarterly basis, not just on half yearly basis. However, I have some reservations. It could be lack of my understanding, uh, lack of my knowledge. KPIs uh, for individually for each and every director, including the non-executive director, might be a tough task to set because uh, board is a collective exercise and the entire team has to work in the interest of the company. So how effectively it could be used, uh, that's a question maybe uh, we will discuss internally with our experts and other experts uh, as to what is the present status, uh, do we really have this? Or maybe you can share over, uh, over the mail, you have the access to my mail ID, your thoughts or I mean, in terms of the present practices, having individualistic KPIs for the directors and how it can be developed as a model for a learning for, for us all. And definitely we can invite you as well uh, to speak on this once we finalize uh, how, how how newer models could be given if, if, if at all I have missed it from my readings and so on. So with this friends, I would like to, uh, I would like to thank, uh, uh, first of all, all the participants for again making uh, uh, the event grand success with a spectacular number of 300. Uh, it touched 300 at a point of time, so I'm sure uh, some people have touched the stairs of the temple and have gone, but yet uh, there are many more who have stayed inside uh, during the entire uh, uh, duration of prayers or chanting Professor Chow. Uh, so, uh, and, and have uh, been a part of it. Uh, it's a great learning. I personally enjoyed Christoph. I'm sure you must have enjoyed uh, thanks to you for participation as a special invitee and, and, and my, my great thanks and gratitude to Professor Chow and Professor Harpreet for uh, uh, sparing their valuable time, especially on the Friday evening when, uh, you know, the weekend breeze is on and we all think of uh, having a relaxed time over the weekend. And uh, 
And, and thanks to NLU Delhi for uh, helping us conceiving this event and bringing the experts on board for a wonderful discussion. Let's meet uh, next week. Till then, uh, put your masks on, uh, keep social distancing, uh, try to uh, have an access to the vaccines if at all it is needed for you, and stay safe. A very good evening to all of you. Good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.